We are living in the midst of a great revolution. True, the 20th century was one of the most violent in human history, and the 21st opened up with its share of wars. Over and over again, we hear that war has always been a part of our history as humans. At present, we might believe that the world is more violent than it has ever been. Yes, there is an overwhelming war system, one that might provide us with a darkening and narrowing vision of the future. It's an old story, but it's no longer the only story. Another is in the making, although most educators, the media, and even presidents don't know about it. Large shifts took place in terms of global collaboration, constructive conflict resolution, and social change. There already are numerous undeniably demonstrable trends leading us toward the evolution of a system of global peace. While all are connected as part of the evolving system, the trends are significant in themselves. In the following minutes, you will be taken on a brief tour of the individual trends. Several might seem familiar and obvious, yet we rarely look at them as an evolving system of global peace. Have you? The emergence of supranational parliamentary institutions to keep the peace is known to almost everyone. Founded in 1945, the United Nations emerged out Today, of the League of Nations. We are being tested. In all we do, let us send a clear message. There can be no peace without justice. Both organizations were responses to the horrendous world wars. While the UN remains imperfect, the goal of these organizations, to prevent war by negotiation, sanctions, and collective security, is revolutionary in the long history of warfare. The peace-building work of UN agencies is crucial to the evolution of a culture of peace. Additionally, the European Union, the Organization of American States, and the African Union monitor regional disputes and engage in peace-building activities. With the human potential to create horrendous weaponry such as landmines or nuclear arms, with the potential to rob the most vulnerable, children, of their potential to grow up in loving care, the successful extension of a regime of international law is a highly important trend. It started early one morning on the 16th of July 1945 at a desert test site in New Mexico. It was here the United States exploded the first atomic bomb and sparked a global race for the ultimate weapon. The world witnessed over 2,000 nuclear explosions, but testing screeched to a halt in 1996, the year that the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty opened for signature. The treaty bans all atomic explosions everywhere on the planet, in the atmosphere, underwater and underground. The International Court of Justice in The Hague exemplifies the trend of a progressive development of international institutions for adjudicating international conflict. Originally called the World Court, the International Court of Justice also led to the development of regional courts in Europe and Latin America, and ad hoc tribunals arose to deal with war criminals. Most recently, the International Criminal Court became a reality. Thomas Lubanga Dailo, the leader of a Congolese armed group, was the first person arrested on an ICC warrant. In March 2012, he was convicted by the International Criminal Court for the war crime of using child soldiers. International courts are a crucial part of an interlocked peace system. United Nations police officers from India stand watch to observe the 2011 election in Liberia, exemplifying the rise of neutral international peacekeeping. Neutral forces, the UN Blue Helmets, composed of several nations intervened to quell conflict or to keep it from reigniting. They have been deployed in dozens of conflicts and are currently serving around the world. And now another new development, nonviolent, citizen-based peacekeeping and peace building, such as the Nonviolent Peace Force and Peace Brigades International, are a reality. Their intervention goes beyond intervention through presence, 
to working on the reconstruction of the social fabric in conflict zones. Dr. Muhammad Yunus, founder of the Grameen Bank, received the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize for advancing economic and social opportunities for the poor, especially women, through pioneering microfinance. The emergence of an international development regime includes large-scale international development banks such as the IMF and World Bank. More important, however, is microfinancing as begun by the Grameen Bank movement in India and thousands of smaller international development non-government organizations. Puhoi, a Patakso Indian and one of the leaders of the International Indigenous Commission, is interviewed by a correspondent at the Global Forum. In the past 20 years, there have been seminal gatherings at the global level aimed at creating a peaceful and just world. This evolution of the global conference movement, initiated by the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, laid the foundations for the modern global conference movement, convened by the UN. Focused on environment and development, it produced a dramatic shift in direction toward the elimination of toxins in production, the development of alternative energy and public transportation, deforestation, and a new realization of the scarcity of water. Major conferences have since been held on a variety of issues and are ongoing. In its most ambitious program in history, Rotary International set the goal to rid the world of polio. They are close to meeting it. This is an example of the emergence of thousands of international non-government organizations providing a wide variety of humanitarian, environmental, peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peace-building services. The Nonviolent Peace Force, Peace Brigades International, Doctors Without Borders, World Vision, and uncountable others support schools in poor countries, provide medical services, or bring clean water to remote communities. All underscore the development of an emerging de facto global citizenship. One people, one planet, one peace. American peace activist Father Daniel Berrigan is arrested for civil disobedience outside the U.S. mission to the U.N. in 2006. A founding member of the anti-nuclear plowshares movement, Berrigan is a perfect example of the development of organized peace action by citizens. Beginning as a religious impulse, peace thinking became a secular ideology arguing for a lawful international order and respect for the rights of peoples. Citizens organized. By the early 20th century, there were perhaps 300,000 European and North American peace activists from over a hundred peace societies. Mahatma Gandhi is known worldwide for his nonviolent leadership in leading India to independence from the British Empire. The development of nonviolent struggle is a largely successful substitute for war. It began with Gandhi, it was carried on by Martin Luther King, and it was perfected in the successful struggles to overthrow the dictatorial regimes of Marcos in the Philippines, the Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe, the communist coup in Russia, and the emergence of the Arab Spring. We no longer need to resort to arms to defend ourselves. It has been conclusively demonstrated that all power comes from below, even in dictatorial regimes. Nonviolence is alive and well. Conflict resolution training and literature is widespread and readily available. The development and spread of sophisticated new techniques of conflict resolution has found its way into dealing with interpersonal, organizational, intergroup, and international conflicts. Techniques known as win-win negotiation, mutual gains bargaining, non-adversarial negotiation, and peer mediation are being taught all over the world from grade school to state departments. Portland State University's master's program in conflict resolution and the University of Uppsala's new Rotary Peace Center exemplify the rise and rapid spread of peace research and peace education. Hundreds of colleges, universities, and schools now provide peace education courses, 
minors, majors, and degrees at the graduate level. Peace research institutions continuously develop more knowledge on how to deal with conflict in nonviolent ways. Wherever there is violence, there is an unresolved conflict. Unresolved conflict means that there is an incompatibility of goals, including means, that has not been resolved, has not been superseded, has not been transformed, has not been transcended. The trend of peace journalism emerged as a response to the conventional bias in favor of violence when reporting conflict. It is an embryonic trend, nonetheless on its way and strongly grounded in demonstrating how bias towards violence can be avoided when covering war in conflict. The first troops leaving Townsville during World War I, August 1914. Once elevated to honor and heroism, we are now experienced the sharp decline in old-fashioned attitudes that war is a glorious and noble enterprise. No troops now march off to war singing as they did in 1914. War is no longer considered glorious, or the health of nations as it was for centuries. There is more evidence and knowledge about the networks of power profiteering from war at the expense of the majority, soldiers and citizens alike. Chancellor Merkel of Germany, President Komorowski of Poland, and President Sarkozy of France discussing matters of the European Union. Former enemies in World War II, they are now exemplifying the rapid spread of democratic regimes in the second half of the 20th century. It is historically demonstrable that democracies do not attack one another. The World Empires and Colonies Before the First World War Now, the world has moved beyond political colonialism. Beginning in the 1960s, the old European colonial empires disappeared, and dozens of peoples became self-governing. The F-22 Raptor is considered one of the most costly warplanes ever built and has been highly controversial due to its burden on taxpayers. The cost of the fighter is one of many examples that contribute to the end of Neo-Empire. Empire is becoming impossible due to astronomical costs and to the further burden of asymmetric warfare. Nations that try to police the world go bankrupt. The international peace arch between Surrey, British Columbia and Blaine, Washington is anchored with one foot in American soil and the other in Canadian. Built in 1921 and dedicated to world peace, the arch represents the longest undefended boundary in the world. The emergence of regions of long-term peace is a trend found in Western Europe for almost 60 years, in North America for 200 years, and in Scandinavia for over 300 years. Peace, like war, is self-perpetuating if a critical mass can be established. Today, no one expects Canadian tanks to roll over the border into Minnesota. Europe. Two world wars were fought and the Cold War separated neighboring nations over decades. Now, a truly open European Union allows for unrestricted exchange of goods and workforce, travel without barriers and restrictions between the nations, and a currency union of several member states. This exemplifies the end of de facto sovereignty. In the modern world, a nation-state can't keep out dangers like missiles and disease organisms, but it also can't keep out ideas, economic trends, and multicultural development through migration. Borders are permeable. Old-style national sovereignty is no longer a description of states in the real world. 
Eleanor Roosevelt of the United States holds a copy of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. The rise of the human rights movement elevated human rights to an international norm, and when they are not respected, it is considered an outrage in most countries. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International are often able to bring effective global pressure on dictatorial regimes to free political prisoners and respect human rights. Women marching in 1912 at a suffrage parade in New York City. 99 years later, women leading a march during the Egyptian Revolution. Women have been significant in some of the Arab Spring movements, especially Yemen and Egypt. There has been a rise of women's rights and the emergence of women in positions of leadership and authority, and consequently the diminishment of the patriarchy in large areas of the world. Patriarchy has been associated with war from ancient times. Many groups and individuals have dedicated their lives to fight the injustices of racism. Albert Lutili of South Africa, Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States, Desmond Tutu, Frederick de Klerk, and Nelson Mandela in South Africa. The decline of institutionalized racism is best exemplified by the end of Jim Crow in the U.S. and the end of apartheid in South Africa. In 18th century England, there were 220 crimes designated as capital crimes, and children as young as seven would be hanged for theft. England outlawed capital punishment for murder in 1965. Worldwide, 58 countries maintain it, 95 have outlawed it, and 35 maintain it but have not carried out an execution for at least 10 years. In the United States and beyond, Sister Helen Prejean has been instrumental in sparking dialogue on the death penalty. Popularized in the Oscar-winning movie Dead Men Walking, Sister Prejean's advocacy for the abolishment of the death penalty is a hopeful sign, exemplifying the gradual decline of capital punishment in most places of the world. In late 2011, Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber moved the trend along by declaring a moratorium on all executions under his governorship. I do not believe those executions made us safer. Certainly, I don't believe they made us more noble as a society. And I simply cannot participate once again in something that I believe to be morally wrong. The human impact on the environment has been catastrophic. The rise of the environmental sustainability movement is aimed at slowing or ending the consumptive excesses that create shortages, poverty, pollution, and environmental injustice in the developing world and oil-dependent economies in the global north. Religion has been used to justify violence and wars. The founding meeting of the World Council of Religious Leaders shows a different story. The religious leaders work to support the efforts of the United Nations in the common quest for peace. More than violence, we are facing the spread of peace-oriented forms of religion. The Christianity of Thomas Merton, Jim Wallace of Sojourners, and Pax Christi, the Buddhism of the Dalai Lama, and similar movements in Judaism, like the Jewish Peace Fellowship, or the Jewish Voice for Peace, and in Islam, the Muslim Peace Fellowship, or Muslim Voice for Peace. A recent moving example was shared by Nevin Zaki via Twitter. Christians joining hands in a circle to protect a Muslim group of protesters as they prayed in Egypt during the 2011 revolution. Conscientious objection has been legalized in many nations. In World War I, some COs were condemned to death. It is important for humans to live up to their realization that they cannot kill or be part of war. Now, war-making powers and legal authorities in many nations recognize conscientious objectors by assigning non-combat duties or work outside of the military. Violence on TV in movie theaters, video game violence, too often we have seen the horrendous consequences.
The reaction against violence as entertainment, both against violent entertainment media and against war toys, is still an uphill struggle. But there are successful bans, significant research and organizations addressing those social diseases. While this movement is embryonic, it is nonetheless underway. The creation of the World Wide Web and cell phones has dramatically increased transparency of government actions. No atrocity escapes notice. The ability of citizen peace organizations to coordinate with each other and to respond to crises as well as making easily available crucial information about war, peace, human rights, it is a force multiplier for the work of peace, justice, and environmental protection. Pancho Ramos Dierle with the Earth Flag. Pancho was fascinated by the stars, planets, and galaxies. He would always look up in outer space and admire the borderless cosmos that we inhabit, and he'd imagine looking down at planet Earth from outer space and not seeing any lines across countries. He envisioned a world of oneness and unity. Pancho exemplifies the gradual rise of planetary loyalty as people begin to see themselves as citizens of the globe in common humanity with all people and with a common need to protect global ecosystems. These trends represent the revolutionary emergence of a culture of peace, giving us realistic hope that the war system is in decline. Be part of it. to space. Russell Schweikert, lunar module pilot for the Apollo 9 flight, recalls the experience. You go around it in an hour and a half, you begin to recognize that your identity is with that whole thing. And that makes a change. And you look down there and you can't imagine how many borders and boundaries you cross again and again and again. And you don't even see them. From where you see it, the thing is a whole and it's so beautiful. And you recall standing out there the spectacle that went before your eyes. Because now you're no longer inside something with a window looking out at a picture. But now you're out there and there are no limits to it. There are no frames, there are no boundaries, 